Good morning, everyone. Whoa. Morning. A time to hear and think about God's word. Before we hear God's word, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, as we listen to your word this morning, please give us the humility to receive it, the understanding to know what it means, and the desire to do what you say. We ask this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. James chapter 4, verses 11 to 12. Don't speak against each other, dear brothers and sisters. If you criticize or judge each other, then you are criticizing and judging God's law. And if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. But there is only one lawgiver, and judge who is able to save and to destroy, and that's God. But who are you to judge your neighbors? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, good morning again, everyone. Good morning. Thank you. It's always the new people that say good morning. That's great. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, today we're continuing our series in uh, the letter of James, very practical book, uh, practical letter. And today we're only looking at two verses, not very much. So how about we begin by praying? Lord, we thank you that you speak to us through your word especially your son, Jesus. And we thank you that through him, all good things come from you. We pray, Lord, that we will see what it means to judge and the damage that it does. Help us to understand how to live as your people, fostering our relationship with you and growing our relationships with each other. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Now, friends, I know what you're thinking this morning. I can see it on your faces. You are thinking, well, today's Bible reading was very, very short. So, therefore, it must mean that today's Bible talk is going to be short too. <laughs> However, if that's what you're thinking, you are wrong. Because today's Bible talk is actually not going to be shorter than normal. In fact, today's Bible talk is going to be harder than normal and you are going to have to think a lot more about what James says. Okay, so that's a warning. You will have to think a lot harder about what James says. And friends, the reason that today's Bible talk is more difficult than usual is that because these few verses, only two verses, the words that James says here are perhaps the most misunderstood and most misused words in the world today. Now let that sink into you. These words that James says are perhaps the most misunderstood and misused words in the world today. And of course, what I mean, thank you, Roy, is this. In verse 12, James says, but who are you to judge your neighbour? Now, friends, has anyone ever said these words to you? Perhaps a wife or a husband, a son or a daughter, a work colleague or a friend, have they said these words to you? Now, they probably haven't said these exact words to you because today in the year 2023, no one actually talks like that anymore. And no one is going to say, who are you to judge your neighbour? No one speaks that way anymore. But perhaps you've heard other words, modern words that mean the same thing. Perhaps someone has said something like this to you, we shouldn't judge other people. Maybe you've heard that. Maybe you've heard it's not right to judge others. 
Or maybe even someone has said to you, stop judging me. Has that happened to you? Now, friends, whenever someone says that to you, it's a very powerful thing. It stops you. It stops what you're doing. You really, really stop when someone says, don't judge me. But, friends, the problem with the way people use these words, don't judge, the problem is people use these words as self-defence. That's how people use these words today. They use it to defend themselves. You know, someone maybe criticises you. Your attitude or a behaviour or an action that you've done, they criticise you and straight away you defend yourself. And that's when you use those words. Don't judge. Don't judge me. And really, when someone says something like, don't judge me, what they really mean is, this is none of your business. This does not concern you. But out. That's what they mean when they use these words. And even amongst the followers of Jesus, this is how some people, even in church, use these words Do not judge. But friends, it's not just James who says things like this. Jesus says it too. James's older brother, he says basically the same thing. And I think James has heard the wisdom of Jesus and now he's sharing the wisdom of Jesus in his letter. But Jesus says this, thank you, Roy. This is from Matthew chapter 7, the famous Sermon on the Mount that we'll be looking at next year. Jesus says these words, do not judge others and God will not judge you because you will be treated in the same way you treat other people. The standard you use in judging is the standard by which you will be judged. Well, there you have it, friends. Jesus says don't judge people because if you do, God will judge you. And because we don't want God to judge us, well, if we use modern wisdom, then we better zip and say nothing at all. That's how the world uses these words. But friends, is that what Jesus and James are trying to teach us here? Is that what it means to not judge other people? Does it really mean to not question what other people do? Does it really mean not thinking about what is right and wrong? Is that what it means to not judge others? Well, many modern people obviously think that's true. And some people, even in churches, yes, they say, we should never tell someone they're wrong. But friends, the problem with with that is if you listen to someone like Jesus and you listen carefully to the very next words that he says in the Sermon of the Mount, you'll realise that this modern way of thinking about judging is actually very wrong. Listen to what Jesus says next. Thank you, Roy. This is the Sermon on the Mount, the very next verse. Jesus says, and why do you look at the speck in your friend's eye and pay no attention to the log in your own eye? Or how can you say to your friend, let me take that speck out of your eye when there is a great big log in your own eye? Hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye and then you'll be able to see clearly to remove the little speck from your friend's eye. Now, friends, no one likes to be called a hypocrite, do they? You know, no one likes it when someone catches you saying, you are really bad, you're doing a really bad thing, when you yourself are doing exactly the same thing. Or even worse, no one likes to be a hypocrite. And our world, our society, in its wisdom, its solution for not being a hypocrite is very simple. They say, don't say anything at all. 
Don't say anything at all. Accept all people the way they are. That way you will never be a hypocrite. But friends, Jesus' solution to not being a hypocrite is totally different. It's completely different to the way the world does it. Because in verse 5, he says it very quick, uh, clearly. He says, look, to avoid being a hypocrite, this is what you do. Number one, take the log out of your own eye. And then when you've taken the log out of your own eye, you will see clearly. Then you will be able to help the other person see clearly. In other words, once you know what's right and wrong, then you can help someone else to know what's right and wrong. That's what Jesus wants his followers to do. That's how he wants them to live, helping each other, learning to do good. However, if you think about what Jesus says here, if you actually do that, you will end up judging a lot. Because you'll have to think about what's right and wrong, what's good and bad. And you may even have to one day look at someone in the face and say, no, that is wrong. Or perhaps someone else will have to look at you in the face and say, you are wrong. Now, can you imagine that? And friends, this is why at the very beginning I said, today, it's not easy. Today, you will need to think very deeply about what James is saying here in these two little verses in James chapter 4. And so let me ask you a question. How can we help each other to learn what's good and bad right and wrong, if we don't judge. How do you do it? How do you learn? Well, really, it, you know, it all comes down to this one word, judge. What does this word actually mean? What does it mean to judge? What does Jesus mean to judge? What does James mean to judge? You see, friends, when they say this, thank you, when James says, do not judge your neighbour, what does he mean? Well, you all know me. I'm a very simple man. I like to keep things as simple as possible. I don't like to confuse things and make things complicated. So what I think James and Jesus are saying is this, thank you, Roy. I think they are saying, do not write off other people. That, that's what they're saying. That's what they mean by the word judge. They are saying, do not write off other people. In other words, whatever they have done, don't condemn them. However bad it looks to you, don't think that you are better than they are. No matter how awful their decisions and their actions were, don't ever think they can never change. That's what James means. Don't write off other people ever. Don't condemn them. Don't think you're better than them. And don't ever think that God can't change them. And really, this way of thinking about this word judge will change every relationship you have. You know, if you hear the word judge on the lips of Jesus, on the lips of James, and you put that word right off in there, it changes everything. It will change every relationship you have. And so what I would like to do now is go back to James's letter and with your permission, 
I would like to substitute the word judge with the words right off. And then as I read these words to you, I would like you to think about what is it that James is trying to teach you. So are you ready? Yes, the front row is always ready. This is great. Thank you, Roy. Now listen carefully. I want you to think, what does James mean here? He says, don't speak against each other, dear brothers and sisters. If you criticise or write off other people, then you are criticising and writing off God's law. And if you write off the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. But there is only one lawgiver and judge who is able to save and to destroy. That's God. But who are you to write off your neighbour? Now, friends, that's very different, isn't it? That sounds very different. And because it sounds so different, I'm going to give you two minutes to talk to the people around you. Just choose one. And try and work out what you think James is saying here. Okay, two minutes. Talk to the person next to you. What is James trying to teach us here? Go for it. Okay, friends, that's enough time. Now, I hope that one of the things you noticed here is that for James, there is a direct connection between writing off people and writing off God's law. Did you notice that? It's very unusual, isn't it? James is saying, when we write off people, when we do that, we're actually writing off God's law. Now, the law that James is talking about is not the Old Testament law. The law he's talking about is the law he has already mentioned in James chapter 2, which is this, thank you, Roy. James said, if you obey the royal law of the kingdom of God, which is love your neighbour as yourself, then you are doing right. You see, when James says the law here, he is talking about God's golden rule of love. Love your neighbour as yourself. And really, James is, is describing the lifestyle of someone who lives in the kingdom of God with Jesus today. That person is a person who loves their neighbour as, as themselves. In other words, in all their relationships, what they are doing is aiming to do God's good in the lives of other people. That is what someone, their life looks like if they are living by the royal law. Love your neighbour as yourself. And very surprisingly for us modern people, this lifestyle of loving others for their good includes helping each other grow in understanding what's good and bad, what's right and wrong. That's part of God's love. Helping each other to grow in our understanding of what's right and wrong. It involves learning from our mistakes, the ones that we made yesterday. It means practicing to do better today than we did yesterday. And friends, if you want to hear a really beautiful description of this life of love lived under the golden rule of Jesus, love your neighbour as yourself, if you want to see an example of that, listen to this. Thank you, Roy. This is the Apostle Paul, Galatians chapter 6. He says this. My brothers, if someone is caught in a sin, you who are spiritual should gently lead that person back to the right path. But watch yourselves, or you also may be tempted. Now, friends, this is the way for God's people 
to help each other grow in godliness. That's it. That's what life under the golden rule of Jesus, love your neighbour as yourself, that's what it looks like. That's it. And as you can see there, there's no condemnation. There's no writing people off to make them change and become better people. That's not how God works. Actually, it doesn't work doing it that way. God knows that. It's not God's way. Condemnation, riding off, thinking that people can never change, thinking that you're better than them. It does not work. It doesn't work. I've been doing it all my life. And it doesn't work. Only God's way works. Living under the golden rule of treating your neighbour as yourself. Gently leading others back to the path of God. That's how we are all to live together. Gently leading each other back to the path of God's goodness. You see, Paul says we approach other people with deep personal humility. Why? Because we can be tempted in exactly the same way as other people. That's why. And when you know that, when you think like that, when you realise that, it will free you not to condemn. Now, friends, this week something very strange happened to me. I read these two verses and suddenly I saw something I've never seen before. I've been a Christian over 25 years, a minister for 18 years, and this week I saw something I have never seen before. And what I saw for the first time was that James says, when we write people off, we're writing off God's law. I'd never thought about that. But look at what James says. Thank you, Roy. He says, if you criticise or write off others, then you are also criticising and writing off God's law. And if you write off the law, you're not a doer of the law but a judge. But there is only one lawgiver and judge who is able to save and to destroy, and that's God. Amen. Amen. Now, friends, this is, I think, the hardest part of today's Bible passage. It's the hardest part. And it's also the most important part. So I need you to think very clearly. I'm going to ask you two questions The first one is this. What does it mean for us to write off God's law? What does it mean to write off the law of God? Secondly, why do we write off God's law when we write off other people? What does James mean? This is really hard stuff, isn't it? What is James talking about? Well, now we know what it means to write off people, don't we? Writing off uh, people means that we think they are not good enough. We think we are better than they. We think they can never, ever change. Well, actually, writing off God's law is very similar to that. You see, when you write off God's law, you believe God's law of love, the golden rule of loving uh, everyone else the way you love yourself. You believe that way of living, that perfect law is not enough. You think the golden rule 
of loving each other is not enough to change other people. That's what it means to write off God's law. You believe it won't work. It's not enough. I have to use something else. I have to do something else. And usually what we do is we condemn other people because we think that condemning them and writing them off will change them. That's what it means to write off God's law. When you write off God's law, you think, oh, my way of condemning will work. It will change them. They'll become better people when I write them off. But as I said, I've been doing that for a long, long time. And you've probably been doing it for a long, long time too. And you know deep in your heart it doesn't work. It doesn't work. Condemnation doesn't work. Thinking that you are better than others doesn't work. Writing them off, thinking that they are losers and no hopers and they can't change, that doesn't work. It never works. Only God's law works. Jesus' golden rule of gently leading others back to God's way. Now, friends, if you have written God's law off, if you think it just doesn't work, well, of course you won't be a doer of the law, will you? You won't do it. That's what James is talking about. He says, if you think it doesn't work, you'll never do it. You'll try something else. You will try condemning people. That's what James is talking about. We won't be happily loving our neighbour, gently leading them back to God's way, because we will be busy condemning them and thinking that that condemnation will change them and make them better people. Now, friends, this is only two verses. <laughs> and what I really like about what James does, he, he finishes with a, you know, reminding us of something that we forget too easily. He says there is only one lawgiver and judge. There is only one who can save and destroy. There is only one person who can do that. And guess what? It's not you. It's not me. It's God. You see, friends, we have to remember every day that God is God and we are not. And when you remember that, that God is God and we are not, that will help you not try to do what only God can do. Save or destroy. Can you see what James is saying? He's saying only God can do these things. And so what we have to do is what Jesus tells us to do. His golden rule of love. Love your neighbour as yourself. And part of loving your neighbour as yourself is gently leading each other, helping each other to live in God's ways. Friends, if we do that as a church family, watch out. Watch out. Who knows what God will do? Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for these words from James. Two verses. Two verses that can change our lives if we change what we think about you and about us. 
Help us, Lord, to take our hands off the steering wheel. Help us to stop trying to change other people in our own strength, using our own words, resorting to hatred and writing off. Help us instead, Lord, to with great prayer and very patiently and with great wise correction help one another walk with Jesus. And we ask for your power, your spirit, your word to do this in our lives. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, friends, I'd like you to stand because we're going to sing. And this song is our collection song. And after that, we're going to share in the Lord's Supper. living the uh, life of salvation with Jesus today begins when we experience God's goodness, when we see his sheer goodness to us. And so as we share in the Lord's Supper, we are seeing God's goodness to us. And so hopefully that will help us to want to have faith and to do good. So a time to share in the Lord's Supper. If you have turned to God and are following Jesus Christ each day, and if you are eagerly waiting for God's Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to come again from heaven, this same Jesus who was raised from the dead and who saves us from the judgment which is coming soon, 
If that's you, then this meal is for you. Now, if you have not turned to God and trusted his son, Jesus, please hold off today. And we look forward to the day when you too can share this meal with us as our brother and sister in the Lord. Now, before we share in the Lord's Supper, we must examine ourselves and we must amend our lives. After all, we are the body of our Lord, his people on earth. Therefore, we must confess our sin and be united in our fellowship together. Above all, we must give thanks to God for the love that he has shown to us through his son, Jesus. That is where faith begins. So before we confess our sins, I'm going to give you just a few minutes to sit there quietly. You may want to just maybe close your eyes, forget about the people around you, ask God to search your heart, to bring to your mind the things he would like to talk to you about. Once you've done that for maybe a minute or two, then we'll confess uh, together. Okay, let us confess our sins to Almighty God using the words that you can see on the screen. Let's say this together. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in our thoughts, words and actions, in the bad things we have done and in the good things we have failed to do. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbour as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly turn back to you. For the glory of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us so that we will be able to delight in your goodness and walk in your good ways. We ask all of this for the glory of your name. Amen. Friends, God is very patient with us. He forgives everyone, anyone who turns to him and trusts in his son Jesus as their Lord and Saviour. And so now we are, like Abraham, friends of God and part of his family. And so we can confidently say, praise, praise the Lord. Thank you, Stephen. We thank you especially for Jesus, our Saviour. We thank you that he died on the cross to pay for our sins and to bring us forgiveness. We thank you that he was raised to life again to give us a new life with you, a new life of salvation that we live now with God and each other through the Holy Spirit. Amen. Friends, the night before he died, Jesus ate supper with his disciples. He thanked God and gave them the bread and said these words, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in memory of me. After the supper, he gave the cup to his followers and said, Drink from this cup. This is my blood that seals the new agreement between God and people. I give my life for you and for many others so your sins can be forgiven. Every time you drink this together, remember me. So friends, let's say this together. We are different people, but we are one in the Lord. Jesus died for us, and so we share together until he returns. Friends, with this bread and this cup, we celebrate freedom. We celebrate God's goodness to us and the freedom that Jesus Christ has won for us and we proclaim three things. His perfect sacrifice made once for all on the cross and his resurrection and his going to heaven in glory. And so in a few minutes when you eat that bread, remember that his body was broken for you to give you salvation. And then when you drink the juice, remember that his blood was spilt for you to give you salvation. So friends, as you eat the bread, remember that Jesus died for you to free you from your sins and to give you a new life, to give you salvation today, tomorrow, forevermore. So be thankful forever. And then as you drink the juice, remember that Jesus spilt his blood for you to free you from sin and death, to give you salvation today, 
tomorrow, forevermore. So be thankful. So friends, let's, let's give thanks saying these words on the screen together. Father of all, we give you thanks and praise that when we were still far off, you met us in your son Jesus and you brought us home to you. Living and dying, Jesus declared your love, gave us your grace and opened the gates of glory to us. Please help us to live the risen life with Jesus. Amen. Father, remember your people. By your spirit, enable us to live for you each day that is the life of salvation. Help us to live holy lives, to tell others about Jesus, and to eagerly wait for his return. Amen. Amen.